Okay, and yeah, we're recording. All right, so hello, this is Krista with thelifeinprogress.ca. I am um, really happy to be here with Mark and Angel Chernoff. Um, we're gonna talk about seeking happiness in hard times today. And I'm gonna dive right in with the first question and then I'm going to actually introduce them to you all. So Mark and Angel, I did ask you in advance to make sure this was okay. Um, I like to ask questions to get to know my guests a little bit more on a personal level. So from both of you, I would love to know what's something that's lighting you up these days and what's something that's feeling um, challenging and inviting you or asking you to do hard things. And I chose that term very specifically because you talk about that in your work. So yes. who would like to start? I can start there. I think um, right now is a very unique time in our lives, how the majority of the world is, you know, um, quarantining themselves and doing the whole stay at home. So I think that that is my answer for both, actually. So what's challenging me right now it is the fact of, you know, staying at home and, and not traveling and not planning to travel and accepting where I am right now and kind of being restricted. Um, so as much as that's challenging, that's also what is lighting me up right now because it's a time where you can slow down, where your to-do list is not a mile long to go to the grocery store, to go to baseball practice, to, to do all of these things that are part of like our normal routine now. And so what is also challenging me is also lighting me up because it's slowing me down. It's forcing me to be more patient, um, to enjoy my, my surrounding, to enjoy my home, to enjoy my family, and to really just be here and be present um, without the chaos of go, go, go. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I can piggyback off that and say that, you know, right now is a very difficult time for those of us who know someone who's come, become ill from COVID. Um, and just, you know, even if you don't know anyone personally, you certainly know someone who knows someone, you know, and, and the news is out there. It's very prevalent. And so, it becomes difficult at times to not let that get the best of you, right? To take that and, and look at those dire situations and say, this is something that I, I need to respect. I need to stay at home to help support those people on the front lines, while at the same time realizing that my ability to stay home and my ability to be well right now is an absolute blessing. And I, I can refocus on my son, on my family, on my wife. I can refocus on the little things that can bring joy to me and the neighbors that are immediately surrounding me. Um, and again, it's finding that balance, realizing that you can leverage the health that you do have, right. And be grateful for it to make a difference where it counts. Uh, again, you know, it, it's easy to get caught up in the anxiety. It's easy to get caught up in the reality, right. Of what's going on. And yet there are silver linings and there are ways that angel and I have found really to dial back into the presence angels talking about to make a difference to, in our immediate family and in the lives of those around us who matter, you know, um, Easier said than done, but going back to the hard things, it's like the little things that you can do on a daily basis. They don't have to be big things, but those little things can sometimes be difficult, right? Taking the extra step, making that extra call, right? Reaching out to the neighbor, making them a little slice of banana bread. Angel's been baking like crazy to, to kind of bring some of that presence into, into our, our present lives. Um, but all of that stuff matters. Those little things are huge wins right now, and, and they, they are worth celebrating. Um, we, I think going back to Angel's point about like, you know, our business constantly, you know, go over to this speaking gig, um, go, go do, do this live seminar, bring these people together for a group coaching session live. You know, these are the things we can't do right now, but there's a lot of little things that we can do and realizing that those little things right now are the big things is a huge step forward for yeah. all of us. I mean, I'm doing things that I've put on the back burner that I, I never had time for that. I didn't see value in making time. Like for example, I'm making my own elderberry now, you know, <laughs> so I've made elderberry, I've made banana bread. Like Mark said today, I have a plan to make my own candles. So just doing like some homemaking stuff that in the past I would have been like, Oh, now it's not the right time. But Right now I have the time. So why not, you know, play with it and entertain and be curious. Yeah. yeah. So you're making elderberry syrup. Is that yep. what you Okay. Yep. <laughs> I actually tried to grow my own elderberry plant. Um, I am not a good gardener, so that didn't happen. However, I do source dried elderberries from an organic market and make my own elderberry syrup. Oh, very good. <laughs> so angels so I just, have you been doing that for a while now? For a year. Yeah, since oh. H1N1. 
many, many moons oh, ago. Oh, okay. okay. So to lessen the severity and duration of the uh, yeah. H1N1 flu. So, yep. Yeah, I've been <laughs> buying it already pre-made. And I'm like, you know, I love it. The same place that I buy it from, they sell the kit to make it yourself at a fraction of the cost. So I'm like, you know what, let me try doing it. And now I'll probably never go back to oh. buying it already made. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so much cheaper and it tastes really good when you make yes. it. Yeah. So thank you guys. And um, so now I'm going to formally introduce you after people have, you know, met you in this little way. But if you don't know Mark and Angel already, um, you can find them at markandangel.com. But your website is actually, if people Google Mark and Angel Hack Life, it'll come up, right? Or just Mark and Angel, yeah. Yep, it'll both. come up. So um, I've actually been following Mark and Angel for years. Um, and they are the um, hosts of a year. Yeah. So a conference called think better, live better. They, um, run that every year and you guys were able to run that right before the pandemic, I think, or just in the months before. So you were yeah, able to do that. So in. Lucky with that. It's crazy when we think about like, I mean, it's one of those things where you got to look at the silver linings and somehow we, we were able to pull off the event. It was a great event this year and it was just before, um, things got bad. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, and Mark and Angel are also authors of a couple books. I've purchased both, but shared one of them with one of my friends, Zena, of Becoming Unbusy, who you met, I shared the love. Um, and my husband, we have your other book right on my coffee table, actually. <laughs> um, and he's not much of a reader, but he really loves, and I've told you this before, but for people who don't know, um, 1,000 Little things happy successful people do differently is a beautiful brightly red colored book and I, what my husband loves is like smaller snippets so mm -hmm. he can take some inspiration kind of digest it but he's not sort of somebody to dive into a long you know long chapters their other book that i shared with my friend is called i didn't write it down getting back to happy yes i did i kind of messed it up i see it on your shelf yet so that one's there. <laughs> yeah. So you guys can ch check those out. Um, and Mark and Angel through their blogs, books, course, and coaching. And the course, I believe, goes by, can you tell us the name of your course? I didn't write it down. It's also getting back to happy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they've been working at all of this for the past decade, writing and teaching proven strategies for finding lasting happiness, success, love, and peace. Um, I have great respect for Mark and Angel and... Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about why I'm always interested in hearing people from people who are walking their talk. And for me, it also matters that people have, um, I'm always more willing to listen to people who have walked through some hard stuff and they had to put what they say they believe into practice in the valley, in the hard seasons. So, um, thank you guys again for being here. I'm Absolutely. truly grateful to yes. be here. Thank you for having us. So um, I mentioned already, but I appreciate that you guys write about happiness and mindset. You do talk a lot about mindset from the perspective of people who've walked through some painful life circumstances. Um, when we encounter pain, uncertainty, loss, you share that one of the first steps towards happiness is simply acceptance of what is. And I like to think of it as coming face to face with the messy reality and then asking myself now, what, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do about this? Um, excuse me. Um, so if we, if we don't do this, sorry, you guys, I'm having, um, I need a drink of water. <laughs> We'll take one with you too. <laughs> <clears throat> so acceptance of what is can feel incredibly brutal at times. Um, and, but if we resist this, if we resist coming face to face and saying, okay, look, this is in front of me, like whether we're talking about a pandemic, a loss, a, you know, um, a tsunami that rips through somebody's homeland, whatever it is, um, we can end up drowning or feeling or staying in suffering as opposed to figuring out how we can move through it. So would you guys talk a little bit about this idea of like, why is it so important, this first step of coming face to face? Well, that's not the words you use. I actually want to use what I read from your words, and that was basically acceptance of what is. So why is that a key to finding happiness? And then I would love it if you guys would share an example from your personal lives. Sure. 
Want me to start? Um, so one of the, the toughest part, parts of dealing and coping with situations like we're in now, but also situations of loss, right? Because that's sort of what we're dealing with at this moment. The loss of the way we expect things to be. The loss of the way we are used to things being, right? We have an expectation of how our lives should be, who should be in them, who should be healthy, um, who we should be seeing and interacting with, how our work feels, right? So it's on the business end and the personal end. And when that is stripped away from us, when we lose our ability to live the life we expect that we were going to be living, we feel pain. And in a pandemic like we're dealing with now, it's widespread. We're, 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 we're taking it from so many different angles. People are losing their jobs. People are not able to see the people they love most. And so it's tough. We're really getting hit from every angle. But even when life is not a pandemic, um, we deal with loss all the time. We lose jobs we rely on. We lose people in our lives that we believe will always be there, right? At least subconsciously, we, we, we envision them as part of our lives. We know life is short, right? We, we know that eventually we're all going to die. And yet that loss is not something we're focused on, right? We have expectations about how much time we have. Um, embracing that is tough. Uh, and yet we cannot be relentlessly positive about our lives in the sense that when somebody passes away, when we lose a job we rely on, when something in our life, like a pandemic, shifts the trajectory of our life for, for a period of time, we can't just go, oh, I'm just going to put on a smile and just step out there, right? I'm going to distract myself. I'm, you know, I'm going to sweep the feelings under the rug and just distract myself with something that brings me immediate joy while avoiding the pain that I'm feeling. Um, we have to address that pain. We have to accept it, acknowledge it, realize that it's there, it's real, um, in order to actually grow from the experience. Right. So I think the word should is just so dangerous. Um, you know, in our head, we're saying like, it shouldn't be like this. Mm. Um, th this isn't how I planned. And I think that's where we're not accepting, you know, we're resisting, we're resisting what is. And the more we resist, the more pushback we're going to get, the more turmoil in our mind and in our body. And so there's so much resistance when you don't accept what is, when you're saying it shouldn't be like this, or what could I have done differently? Or how did I contribute to this? Or if I expected it to be this, I want to be doing this. I think that that's just where so much turmoil comes from. And I, I think it's important important to to start with like you said acceptance and saying you know you accepting what is because you can't change it right and so first you have to acknowledge that this did happen and you have to accept where you're at um and kind of let go of that 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 resistance and surrender to like okay accepting where you are in this moment, not in the future, not in the past, but in this moment. And then once you can begin there, then you can take positive steps forward. Yeah. And one simple way to do that would be just to ask yourself <clears throat> about the truth, right? Like the, the, we always have that, that statement in our mind, it shouldn't be the way that it is, right? Like this wasn't supposed to happen. This isn't supposed to be my life. And you ask yourself, is that true? Is it true that it's not supposed to be like this? Well, how is it right now? The reality is it is this way. So to say that it's not supposed to be this way is not accurate because it is this way. And that is a very hard pill to swallow, but that's the beginning of acceptance. It's sitting with that question, answering it, looking at it face to face and saying, okay, here's where we are. Now, where do we, where, where, what do we want to do from here? Because this is where we are. Um, again, to distract ourselves with relentless positivity or, or toxic positivity, or, or distraction, right? Like just not acknowledging that reality, but instead wishing it were different and then moving over to something, could be alcohol, it could be Netflix or whatever, that just pulls us away from it, um, can be helpful for dealing with small bits of coping, right? I'm not gonna say like, don't distract yourself at all, don't do something that brings you joy, but we do have to face reality also, right? So it's both. And I think it's acceptance is for the big things and for the small things. Like it's not just for the major, you know, life events that happen, but it's also for the small things. Like my, my, I have a, we have a five-year-old son, Mac, and I, I probably tell him at least once a day, like, don't resist. Like, you know, just like be here, like, don't stop resisting. Like, cause you know, in a child's eyes, whatever you say, they're going to say the opposite. Like, you know, like, oh, well, I'm not doing that. It's this way. And it's like, can you just not, not, not like just surrender and stop resisting? 
for this moment and listen to why I want you to do it this way, how it can be helpful. So I think acceptance, it's important to acknowledge that it, yes, it works for the big things, but it also works for the daily small things too. Yeah. So before we move into your personal examples, I just want to spin off on what you shared. And I, I so agree. And I think this is actually like, yeah, so critical for experiencing happiness and life satisfaction. Um, one, like this, this is a little bit of an offshoot, but one, the idea that happiness isn't dependent upon perfect circumstance. We're going to talk more about that later. Um, happiness is permissible and we can actually experience happiness even in the middle of pain something that i talk about a lot i actually i think it's shitty and i don't i wish i didn't have to <laughs> go through this but here i am facing reality and um and i and coming to the realization that i can be i can actually feel happy even as i experience pain it is both and it's not one or the other um, but the happiness, sort of that, um, Angel, I forget the exact words you use, but you're talking about the little choices. And I think how, how this becomes more obvious in crises, right? And yet in our every ordinary day, when somebody's annoying us, or when, you know, I don't know, these minor irritations that we can allow to really color our whole day, sometimes it's in these more kind of profound seasons of life where we realize how often we allow these little teeny things to rob us of joy right or um or tell us the story that oh life isn't okay because of these things and it's like well actually that's not true it happened yes this is frustrating and also i have this full beautiful life mm -hmm. that just feels so important I, I know that i have to practice that on a daily basis and i'm assuming that you guys do too just like you're teaching that yeah, absolutely. And even, you know, with the acceptance, uh, with Mac, it goes the other way too. Like I need to resist, I need to stop resisting what he wants to do or what, what his actions are daily that are just part of him. And so I, I think it, it's important to know that it goes both ways that I want him to stop resisting what I want to get done. But then also I, I need to choose my battles. I need to not you know, micromanage every move he does. And I need to accept who he is and what he enjoys doing and, and let that be. Yeah, appreciate the little bit of that fighting spirit, right? Yeah. That all children <laughs> have, you know? Um, yeah, it, and it's, it's not like, you know, right now while we're in the stay at home mode, um, obviously all of those little things are just more obvious, right? Because we're spending so much time together, which again is an, an amazing blessing, but you have to keep yourself in check. And I agree with Angel entirely. It's about the willingness to listen to a five and a half year old as much as you do guide them um, because it, we're all in it together. Yeah. And um, so I, I, and we are going to move into this, I think, um, right up soon. But I think um, what, what it brings up for me to this truth that, um, like Mark, you were saying that and we're, it isn't about relentless positivity. It isn't about, so surrender to what is or embracing what is or coming face to face with the reality of what is and accepting this truth and this, re this thing that's in front of us doesn't mean we're not allowed to acknowledge pain, acknowledge loss. I think what it means, and you can tell me if you disagree or agree, but um, I think what it means is that we're allowed to have all of the murky feelings and the the even the pain and the grief and the wishing and then still say okay and now what and and what am i going to do right so um i think that's allowed because i because I, I do think that we need space for people to tell the truth about their pain um and or their fear or their grief and then just say and then also support them in choosing their response, right? So, yeah, do you want to say anything about that? Sure, sure. So, I mean, I, you know, I brought up the idea of truth, right? That um, we have to acknowledge it first. So is it true that this should not have happened to me or that this, that this should not have been the outcome? And when we look at the reality, we can obviously give ourselves that very hard reality check and we say, well, how is it? And the answer is it is the way it is. So then I would move on to maybe another very pertinent question, which is how do you feel when you think this thought that this should not be the way it is? 
Like when you have that kind of thought process, process going through your head constantly, when that is the mantra, what is that doing to you? How do you treat the situation you're in? How do you treat yourself, the people who you love? Um, who are you with that thought in your head, that train of thought? Um, that's an important thing to mull over. Like, what is that thought doing to you? Um, and then another question that we, we often like to challenge people with is who would you be if you could remove that thought, right? And so again, that's not, you know, it's not easy to do that, but if you can visualize magically somehow erasing that thought from your mind that it shouldn't be the way that it is or whatever that specific train of thought is, what else would you see about your life, right? Like you just said, Krista, like, we have the pain, we have the situations, the things that happened to us, the things that we didn't necessarily deserve, the things that we couldn't control. But if that wasn't the sole focal point of our vision right now, what is in the periphery? What are the beautiful parts of our life that we're looking straight past to focus on the one thing or the few things that are absolutely driving us mad? And it does not, by, by, by broadening our focus into the periphery, it does not erase the bad, right? It does not erase the negative and the real events that have occurred but it gives us a bigger picture. It gives us a, a, a broader view that we can leverage to exist and to live and to address the pain points, right? If we're, if we're sitting just with the pain and only with the pain, yeah. we're not able to address the pain from different angles. But if we can broaden our focus, we can live in the bigger picture of our lives. We can then leverage the good to make the best of the bad. And, and so that, that, those are like some of the challenging questions, you know, like this should not have happened. This should not have happened. What's the truth? <laughs> and right, what is the truth? Who am I with this thought in my head, this mantra in my head that this should not be the way it is? And who would I be and what else would I see about my life if I could get past that thought? If I could slowly and gradually practice looking at the broader you know, perspective on my life, how would that arm me in a way that supports my growth as opposed to keeping me stuck and keeping me in pain? Yeah. But I mean, and you're absolutely right, Krista, like pain and happiness can coexist. You're, you're allowed to be in pain and also have moments of happiness and also be happy, but then have moments of pain. You know, this topic is, you know, very relevant to our past and even our present. Um, just recently on Easter Sunday, our best friend's father had a massive heart attack and passed away. Just like that. 63 like, years old. Healthy. And, and, and he was a vegetarian, very healthy guy. I mean, like he, he was not the guy that you would go, oh, oh yeah. Well, maybe it was because of that, right? He was like doing all the things right. Um, so it was just such a huge surprise at 63. And so, you know, that just happened a little over a week ago. And that was shocking to us. And of course, that's something like you ne we never, you know, that wasn't on our radar that, you know, that the last time we saw him was going to be the last time that we would see him. And so, yes, in the beginning, we were asking all of the questions. Why did this happen? It shouldn't have been like this. But when we're able to, like, come to the realization and accept it, while we're sad and in this pain, we can also smile at the memories we have and the jokes and, you know, just go reminiscing and able, being able to do that with his family and our best friend and his wife. And so, yeah, we still, you know, obviously this is very new and even going forward, we're going to have bouts of sadness, but we're able to acknowledge the sadness and acknowledge the pain while also saying, okay, well, you know, Let's share a memory with each other. Let's, let's share pictures and talk about it. And then kind of, you know, smile and laugh, even though we're sad. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, he was kind of like our, we'll call it the second mutual father. Like there's my family, Angel's family and the, the Sobies who are a family that's just, you know, it's our family, right? It's the family you choose. And we've been best friends with like Sam, the one, the one, but like the whole family for, for a couple decades. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, a hundred percent, like we've had to dial it back, you know, um, and look at, look at the silver linings, right? It, like it, it is not easy to do that. We, and we've all experienced deaths, right? We've all experienced those losses and this is the most recent for us. And it's just been, you know, catching yourself in those moments of, of, of trying to make sense of the senseless, right? Trying to make sense of something that you can't really rationalize, right? These things happen. Um, and so then we turn our focus to celebrating that human being, the life, the joy, the, 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 the memories that they gave us and not just looking at it as a relationship that happened in the past, but 
as one that we're going to carry forward with us, right? The relationship doesn't end. The impact on our life is, is not something that ends here. It's going to be carried forward for years to come in so many ways, everything from those wonderful conversations to just doing things differently based on the memory of that human being. So it, it, it's been, you know, this is something that is tough. And yet we look for those silver lines. We look for that broadened perspective. Um, again, it doesn't bring that person back. It doesn't erase the pain, but it says, okay, let's, let's now move away from the immediate pain into the bigger picture so that it can coexist with all the great stuff that's there too. Um, and certainly, you know, when you lose somebody, you also look at your own life and your own health and, and the little things, right? Like the cliche of life is short and you say, what am I going to do today? That's going to matter, right? I mean, we, we can leverage a little bit of that almost selfishly and personally, um, which we've been doing, you know, um, looking past some of those little annoyances you talked about earlier, right? Like just that doesn't matter. Like, come on, like, let's just, Let's, let's focus on making the best of today, the good and the bad alike. So um, we're spending a lot of time on this point, but it, again, it's because I really think it's important and I really feel like right now, um, I, this idea matters. And, and just, I think sometimes hearing it from different perspectives and even different terminology can be useful to people so that they can find a way to kind of make it their own and start practicing. So um, like the idea of finding a silver lining, I don't use that term. I don't personally, it, it doesn't work for me. So you guys know my son died almost six months ago. I do not look for a silver lining in this type of pain. However, I completely am on board with the idea of broadening my perspective and being allowed to see that this is real and this is not what I wanted and this hurts and also it's one part of my full beautiful life. And so um, this idea that, um, you know, that I black and white mentality or that cognitive distortion that tells us it's all or nothing, it's all joy or it's all suffering, it's all good or it's all bad. And that we can explore this and examine it for truth. Like you started with those questions, like even, you know, is this true? Like, how do I, who am I when I believe this? You know, that my life is all bad because of this. And we can start challenging that and looking for a way to see that even if we're in the thick of, like I say these days, the thick wilds of grief or, or of uncertainty, right? The person who just, their, their dad just died in the hospital without them, or they don't know how they're going to feed their kids this month. Like this is serious stuff, right? Can we, um, can in acceptance of the reality in front of us, can, I think we can, no matter what, find our way forward. And I think that's the goal, right? It isn't to say that we have to find um, the good in this, this situation so much as, but you are allowed to still find your way forward. You are allowed to, um, you do have resilience. You do have the capacity to do hard things and, and take one step and then another. So it's a really big topic, right? It's like so big, but it just feels so present, like real right now in this season. And um, somehow I, I want to transmit hope, I think, to other people who are like really in hard, hard, challenging circumstances to see that this is possible. It is even possible to allow for happiness in the middle of uncertainty and, and grief or pain. So... Would you um, be willing to share another, like, do you have another personal example that you'd like to share of where you've practiced this coming I mean, acceptance of what is so that you can, could find happiness? Sure. And then, um, I mean, I can, we can actually dial back to the beginnings of our blog. I tell you, I, I think that that might be interesting um, to explore that. So I have a degree in engineering. Angel's got her MBA. Um, we, got into the work we do today out of sheer necessity, right? Um, not because this was our idea of start, let's, let's start a life coaching business. Um, so go back to the 2007 timeframe. Um, you know, we're in our you know, mid to late twenties. We have no, we've never really encountered grief. We've never encountered loss like we're talking about now. Life was good. You know, like uh, the, the dream with it, of going to college, getting, you know, degrees and going out there in the working world and, and exploring life together as a couple. I mean, it was all there. Um, and so we, we lost a mutual best friend, Josh, to cardiac arrest at 27, which is highly unusual, obviously, at that age. Um, 
he it was driven by an, a severe asthma attack. So that's what dr drove the cardiac arrest. Um, and within two weeks of that happening, Angel's uh, brother took his own life. Um, this was the downturn of the economy. Angel was the breadwinner of the family. I was always working for these quick startups, um, doing some interesting things, and Angel was holding down for it financially, so she loses her job. So we uh, have never encountered grief. We are struggling with the grief and the loss. We are struggling financially with the job loss. Um, we were a newly married couple at the time, so we, we, rather than having the conversations that needed to be had, we were distracting ourselves, bypassing, turning to the alcohol, turning to the distractions, just not, again, not addressing the pain, really bypassing the pain. And so everything came to a head. And um, we, we saw some, some therapists and coaches. We were smart enough to kind of say, like, let's not run away from this. Let's step into it a little bit. So that was this, this call it our silver lining of a very dire situation. We had that sense. Um, and from that, our blog was born. And our blog was born as an accountability journal for us. So we weren't writing for anybody else. We were learning things from therapy sessions. We were learning things from great books, Eastern philosophy and Western alike, right? The Byron Katie's and the Wayne Dyer's of the world. We were processing that individually. We were leveraging some of what we were learning to start having the conversations that we needed to have as a couple. We started a daily ritual in our life. Uh, we were not on speaking terms at the time, but we started taking this, taking this walk together at the same time every day. Um, not even speaking, but just being in the presence of one another and doing that consistently. That process eventually led to conversations about the things that we were reading in the therapy sessions. And from there, we decided to start this blog where we would work on it together, something we could do together again. And we would hold ourselves accountable to the things we were learning and the things that we agreed we both needed to be working on together. Um, and so that was the beginnings of the blog. Um, it was a, a tough time in our life. And um, what was interesting about being vulnerable and about addressing, doing the hard things, right? The things that no one else could do for you, the things that made you at times question how much longer you could hold on and push yourself forward. Um, the interesting thing about that was that one day at a time, um, not only did we grow from it, but people out there who, who could see a public blog, again, it wasn't being advertised anywhere, but you know, social media, Twitter and stuff, where, you know, Facebook was taken off at that time. Uh, it, was, it was much smaller than it is today. But people started writing us and saying, you know, these things that you're sharing, these stories, uh, these little tips that are helping you, they're helping me too. Let me tell you my story. What do you think of this? And, you know, through that, we, we, we realized we had started a, just a little community of people who were willing to be vulnerable and share. And, and it's amazing how powerful that can be. Yeah. Um, and so it's something to keep in mind, that, like when we are struggling, when we are at our lowest, um, when we are willing to do the hard things and address it, we also give hope to those around us. Um, and that includes the people in your immediate family, like for Angel and I, we were trying to do that for each other, not even in, with the intention to do it for others. And that's ultimately what happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, you take those three life events that happen in our life back to back. And of course, my initial reaction is to resist all of it, to question why, to like, how could this be possible to to not accept it for the longest time. I didn't want to accept it. Uh, I mean, my friend passes away at 27. He has two kids, a two-year-old and a five-year-old. Like, it's just, I had talked to him the night before. There were no signs of anything happening. And then my, my brother, you know, dies by suicide. And these things, there, there's no right answers, right? There's no answers. It's unanswered questions. And But if I keep asking myself, there's no right answer to the questions that I had. And there's no answers at all, let alone right answers. There's no answers at all to all of these questions. And so I was resisting it for the longest time. Um, and so it's like coming to that that place of acceptance and saying, what's the next right thing? Right. Like it's not, you, you know, even as you're going through a very dark period in your own life, you know, if you listen to this conversation, it doesn't make everything better. Right. You're still questioning yourself, but it's accepting where you're at and saying, OK, what can I do today? What's the next right thing? Maybe it's just getting out of bed and taking a shower and that's it. Um, maybe another day, you know, going for a walk around the block, making yourself a to-do list. Like it's going to be different for every single person. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, what's the next right thing I can do today with what is reality, with what is real, with what is current, if I can accept it. And then, yes, you said, you know, there's no silver lining. You, you don't like that, that term. Um, and 
years from now, like not to say that there's a silver lining, but if you look back on our life in that very tough period in 2007, 2008, 2009, like when we look back on it now, we're able to appreciate how those events have helped us get to where we are today. Like we would have never probably been in this line of work had that stuff not happened. And I'm not saying I would want that stuff to happen again, but I can say that we took the events that happened in our, in our lives and we made the best of it. Yeah, and Josh's widow, Cammie, uh, now one of our best friends, works with us. And so she attends every one of our events. She supports, I mean, she's actually like kind of our one, we'll call it employee, but not really an employee, a partner, you know, in, in the business. She's been there since the beginning. Um, and so, I mean, again, it, it's, it is, is not so much a silver lining as it is just a reality that you can take an impossible situation and work with it to have it serve you and help you grow. Right. And, and, and if done right, it, and you don't have to, you don't have to touch everyone with it. Like our business happens to be something that, that is read online, right? Like it, t it touches people we don't know, but a lot of times it's just touching your family. It's just touching the people who are closest to you. Like when you leverage these scenarios that seem impossible and you, 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 you work with them instead of against them, instead of the resistance, there's the acceptance, right? In some cases that's happiness, right? And those, it, 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 the journey of happiness is not changing what happened. It's accepting what happened so that you yeah. can ultimately overcome it, right? Um, yeah, I think Steve Jobs said it best. You know, he has that line, like you can't connect the dots looking forward, yeah. but you can always connect them looking backwards. And sometimes that when you're looking backwards, maybe it takes years to connect the dots. Agreed. You know, when, when, you're, when you're in that storm or when you're too close to it, it's hard to see it. Um, but they will eventually connect when you're able to look back. Yeah. As long as, as, long as you are, we, we talked about like the rituals, like the idea that you do have to take small steps. We, we've said that. And I think that's one of the most important takeaways for when you're in one of these seasons is that the things that you're doing on a daily basis, your rituals or your habits, whatever you want to call them, are either serving you or they're, or they're holding you back, right? And it, 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 it's, it's worth doing a hard thing, which is taking a look at how you are behaving on a daily basis, right? Especially in those seasons, which can be tough because there's going to be periods where you just need to bury your head in a pillow. There's going to be periods where you do need to be able to take those those leverage distraction to just take a deep breath but then you also need to look at how your daily routine is serving you or holding you back and and and, and asking yourself like what is it that i need to change here like what is it what is it that i want to feel you know what is it that i want to feel going forward and and what am i what can i do now that's going to help support that and how do i not want to feel and what am i doing that's supporting this thing that i don't want to feel you know so Again, these are, these are easy, easy to say, much harder to do when you're in, 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 a, in a, a tough season, especially of your life, but, but it's worth looking at because it's those small steps that move you from where you are to where you want to be. And that can be, it can make, make, make all the difference in, in the outcome, right? The oh. growth. So um, I'm just going to jump over one of the questions and let's move right into this idea of um, these small daily habits that you were just referring to, Mark, in a recent blog post, just Last week, I think I read, um, you wrote, inner strength is always built through lots of small daily victories. It's the individual choices we make day to day that build our inner strength muscles. So um, let's talk about that. Um, I often share, and, and it, I like to look at research, like I like to look for a good evidence base because, and I tell my kids, it's like often my emotions tell me to hide under the covers and not get up again. But if I look towards science or like what the research says, it reminds me just do the next right thing, like Angel, you said. Um, and so that that is a powerful motivator for me. Is there some evidence to back this up? And one of the things is like researchers, the, the numbers vary, the specific numbers vary a little bit, but um, it seems that um, researchers believe that about 40% of our happiness is actually a direct result of what we think or how we behave. These are the small daily habits that we can choose for ourselves, right? So there's a lot of power in that. That moves, that's beyond genetics and beyond circumstances. So that's a 40% is a big number. Um, and so let's talk about that. Like what else would you like people to know about this idea that um, you said we build inner strength muscles, which is sort of this capacity to do hard things as resilience through small daily victories. 
Sure. I think as human beings, like, like you said, uh, in all walks of life, we almost naturally overestimate those big defining moments in our lives and underestimate the little things we do on a daily basis. Um, to your point, Krista, we are happiest when we're making progress in our lives. That is why that 40% exists. That is why those researchers see that the things that we do, the way we behave on a daily basis, the little actions we take lead to happiness because we, we underestimate how powerful progress is, right? Even when we're in a difficult circumstance, no, I'm not where I want to be yet. Yes, there's a lot I still want to achieve and a lot I still want to change and, and things I need to get beyond and move past. But let me look at where I was yesterday. And if I'm just a one, if I'm just a couple steps forward, if I'm really, if I've just made a few bits of progress, I will feel so much better than if I haven't. The progress is a measure. It's a, it's a mile marker for happiness in our lives. Um, and we sometimes forget about that. And, the pro, and again, progress doesn't have to be big leaps. We're talking about small steps. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's realizing that the things that we do daily are actually the things that matter most, right? We, we can have goals. We can, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can project ourselves out into the future for these, big, these bigger things, these bigger changes. But sometimes when we're focused on that, the weight of it sits so heavy on our shoulders and so heavy on our hearts that it ultimately makes us feel worse, right? We're like, oh, we're not, we're, we're not where we should be yet. Um, so we, we, we forget about the goal. We forget about those big visions. And we just focus on today and we say, okay, like what, what's going to move me one step closer? And that is something we can feel great about, especially if we track it, especially if we do something visual, yeah. like make it a little don't break the chain thing yeah. or something. If, and, and reminding yourself that anything that brings you discomfort is most likely helping you grow. Mm. Like reminding yourself anything that's difficult or causing you discomfort, just doing a little bit out of that is going to help you grow. I mean, you know, we talked about how we do our annual event every year. Is that easy for me? No, to get on stage, to prepare, to be vulnerable. No, that's not hard. That's not easy. But I remind myself that every time I do it, I'm getting better and better. And, you know, it's that, that, confidence we think like one day we're just going to wake up and have the confidence to do x y and z and it's no it's every time we do that activity we're gaining confidence in our ability to do it in our progress so it's not that we're just going to wake up one day and feel better but we're going to wake up and do a little bit every single day to get us there right. because we, we will start becoming who we are you know like it will start to identify with the process of what we're doing um you know, to Angel's point, I think that's an interesting thing. It doesn't, it's not necessarily relevant to everybody, but it's, it is in a sense that we had one of our best think better, live better um, events this past February. It's our fifth year doing it, uh, an annual event when we've done a bunch of smaller kind of versions of the event. And what's interesting, Krista, is that it, I, I think it would be safe to say we were the least prepared we'd ever been, i.e. least prepared in the sense that we didn't spend as much time in the month leading up to it getting every little duck in a row. But we had been overprepared in the sense, to Angel's point, that we had been doing it for years now, right? And so it is a part of who we are. All the little things that we had done leading up to this year's event, it didn't matter how prepared we were. We were prepared because we'd been doing all those little things for all, that, all those coaching sessions, all of it added up. And so when we showed up this year, there was just something about not trying to do something specific, but just being with the people in the room doing on-stage coaching sessions that were totally raw and totally real and completely unrehearsed that added more value than anything that could have been rehearsed, right? And so you get to that point of feeling comfortable doing those hard things by those daily practices, right? By, by, by walking the talk. Um, and I think that is relevant when you think about that example and it re in relation to everything else that we do in our lives. It's so true. It's like, just do the right things on a daily basis. Learn from the wrong things, right? bring it all together so that you're moving forward. And, and it like that process of personal growth, mindfulness, whatever you want to call it becomes a piece of who you are. And then you're able to show up to difficult situations and do hard things with the most poise and, and, and the most preparation imaginable because you've been practicing right subconsciously and consciously for, 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 a while. Mm. That's what matters in the end. And I think we can all think of examples in our own life of something that used to be difficult that now is easier, or you can do it without the discomfort. 
Um, and just, you know, a silly example, my son is in kindergarten and he's like, oh, this stuff is easy. And I'm like, it's only easy because you've been doing it mm. and you've learned it. And so now it feels easy to him. And he's like, oh, this is baby work. And he jokes around <laughs> about it. But I'm like, it's only easy because you've done the work up until this point. Mm. Yeah. I know I get a lot of comments from people in my community and I appreciate it, of course, but saying, you know, you're so strong, how can you even show up? And I can speak with um, complete honesty and say, the only reason I'm standing today is because of all of the practice over the past, especially the eight, nine years. Um, even in small daily victories, like, um, the habit of self-kindness, the habit of a morning and evening routine that includes a gratitude practice and noticing what I've done well each day, the habit of learning vulnerability and making bids for connection instead of isolating and spiraling, like these, the consistent, deliberate, imperfect, but conscious and, you know, intentional practice over years and years and years um, and so I personally love this because I, I know that the only reason I'm standing right now is this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not because of some great light bulb, mo although I've had lots of beautiful light bulb moments over the years, but like, honestly, I think it's the practice. It's the hard work and showing up and picking myself up when I fall, not waiting for Monday, not waiting for next month. It's like, nope, own it. Who do I want to be? Move forward, you know, um, that daily practice. So it's so, so, so powerful to build a beautiful and happy life, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Because you, you're identifying with these rituals that you have in your life. So it's no longer something I, I do here and there, but because you had built these rituals in your life already, it was a part of you. So when you went through this tragedy, this unthinkable tragedy, you're able to, to reference those and go back to them and, and, and continue to practice them because it's a part of who you are. Yeah. I mean, there's that saying like how we live our days is how we live our lives. Yeah. Right? How we spend our days is how, how we, we spend live. our lives. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's so true. I mean, it, 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 we, we often forget that we project ourselves. Um, we, we either project ourselves into the past or project ourselves into the future um, and, and kind of lose track of the little wins. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest things that we can do for all, ourselves and something that we constantly have to practice at um, is you know, even when we're staying home and seemingly have you know simpler lives if you will right now like if, if, if we're practicing that um, it still it can can go can kind of slip our minds to just keep track of it like yeah. let's just keep track of the wins have a little journal have have something where you can look at like your little daily rituals and go okay I'm getting it done you know and I'm feeling great about that I mean one that Angel and I have briefly mentioned it was don't don't break the chain like we have a series of little rituals that we want to achieve for ourselves and we just put, we have like a, a wall calendar where you can see the whole year in one shot. And so Angel and I will both put a little strike through a day just to visually say like, okay, we've, we've been going strong for a month and a half here on the day where we don't feel like doing it. We can look at that and go, all right, I'm not going to break the chain. Right. And I can feel good about the progress I've made too, just visually simple stuff. And yet it works, you know, it, it works, especially right now when we don't have all the other things to, to reach for. Yeah. And uh, I, I have that quote that Mark just said, you know, how you spend your days is how you spend your life because it's not about the next vacation. It's not about this big moment. It's not about Friday or this weekend. It's like, how can you feel that way today? And yes, it doesn't have to be big. It can even be a minute. It can, it can be making a good dinner for my family, you know, that I, I tried a, a new meal and I liked it and it was good. Like, what are the little wins? It's not the big ones, but it's every single day. You can't, you can't be this person every day and then think that this one day it's going to be all better and it's going to be great. But it's like the little things. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you spend your life daily instead of just this big moment, defining moment? Yeah. So um, I'm just, I'm watching the time and I really want to still get to a couple questions. So, but um, we've totally skipped over um, chatting about relentless positivity. I do want to come back there just before we end, but would you guys, you've already shared that idea um, of your, your don't break the chain. Um, what else, like let's leave listeners with a handful of concrete habits that they can begin to practice even today, whatever circumstance they're in. And I, I do mean whatever, like, you know, some of us are sort of 
enjoying a simpler, slower lifestyle. Others are, you know, going out to work on the front line, dealing with so much stress. So what are some things that all of us can actually practice to begin um, putting into play this idea of small daily habits or what I want to see again, the word that you use, these small daily victories that can move us into this, what can help us actually just show up how we want to be in the world. So I think we'll, we can do it twofold here. Like we'll do one that's positive um, that I'll talk about. And I think for you, do the one that's like what people wouldn't think, like the, the journal, the, the thoughts. Stuff. Oh, yeah, the thoughts. Can, for the, yeah, um, so my, my initial reaction would be, and something I've been embracing more lately than in the past, is meditation. Um, because meditation brings you to the present moment. It helps you be present and accept what is. And um, for people who's, who are new to meditation, it may sound like, oh, that's not for me. But an easy way to do it is there's an app called Insight Timer, and it's absolutely free, and it's guided meditation. And if you're new to it, you can just pick one that's under five minutes. You know, they have ones that are one minute. And with, with habits and rituals, and the, the key is to do it consistently and daily. So if five minutes sounds too long, do the one minute ones. Like do something that is so easy, it seems silly that you wouldn't do it and stay consistent with that. And so, yeah, just download this app, Insight Timer on your phone and you go to guided and then you can pick just one to five minutes and then you can pick a category like happiness or spirituality or relationships or grief. Um, and it's really great. And it, 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 right in the app, it tracks how many consecutive days you've done it. And so I challenge you to, to, to do the insight timer, to do the guided meditation, because it brings you to the present. It helps you accept where you are in this moment. And that's something like we've talked a lot about on this call is just coming here now, not thinking about the past or the future, but being present in this moment. So I would challenge everyone to do, to do some form of meditation and just focusing on your breath and let the guided aspect of it just let you think about things you normally wouldn't. Yeah. And remembering too, that like, like Angel said, I agree entirely that it's about the consistency. If you do that one day, interesting, maybe you have a couple interesting realizations, but the consistent practice of that, they say it takes about 60 days for the human being to create a habit, right, in their life. And so challenge yourself right now, especially now, right, where a lot of us have a little less that we're, that we're doing, right? It doesn't make it easy, but challenge yourself to take the next 60 days and, and do the meditation, Focus on the present, focus on the bright side of your life, and you will rewire your brain, whether you realize it or not, right? That's important to keep in mind. Consistency, doing it daily for 60 days. Um, so, I, you know, I brought up a little bit of this with you already, Chris, and I assume this is what, you, what Angel's talking about, um, the idea of challenging the thoughts. So we have the meditation on a positive end. We have a gratitude journal that a lot of people understand, right? Sit down at the end of the day. Let's focus on some of the, the small wins of the day. Very important stuff. But I brought up the idea of challenging the negative thoughts, right? Challenging the, the, the negative realities in your life. Um, and so I would challenge people to create a journal based on that. So a little bit tougher, the, the harder thing to do. On a daily basis, whenever you notice one of those thoughts coming to mind, whenever you feel that anxiety or that extra weight on your mind, the it, the shoulda, woulda, couldas, that this isn't the way it's supposed to be, that I'm not good enough, right? Like those feelings, whatever that is, you feel that anxiety starting to rise. Take note of it. And instead of distracting yourself, bring awareness to it. And then take 60 seconds or 30 seconds and just do a raw brain dump. Whatever is in your head at that moment, no matter how irrational, get it out of your head and down in a safe place. It could be in, a, in your, your iPad or iPhone. It could be just a paper and a pencil. Um, do that as often as you need throughout a week, right? The obvious immediate benefit is that you are bringing awareness to it. You're not bypassing it. You're bringing awareness. I'm having that thought, but I don't want you to judge yourself. I don't want you to try to self coach in the moment. Nothing like that. Just literally the process of, Oh, here it is. Let me take 60 seconds and just write down whatever it is that's exactly on my mind. And it's important to do that in the moment because 
we are really good at downplaying our oh, emotions. Yeah. Like if I were to ask you, Hey, Krista, how did you feel? You know, last Friday when you were having a really bad moment, if I were to ask you that today, you'd say, you know, it was tough, but it was okay. You know, I no got, o- deal. I yeah. got over it. But in that moment, it was affecting everything you were doing. It, you saw no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no way out. Um, it, we've all felt like that where it's always going to be like this. And we've had those thoughts and And we want those thoughts. We want those raw emotions that we want to work through because those are the thoughts that are stopping you from making progress, that are that are stopping you right in your tracks. And so it's important to write down those thoughts when you're feeling your blood boil, when you're you're feeling emotional, to get those thoughts down on paper. And again, it doesn't have to be anything long, um, just a sentence or two. Um, Maybe on some days you only have one, on other days you have 20. Um, so it's important to get those raw thoughts down. Yeah. The, the devil is in the details, right? Like the, the, like the angel said, if, if you try to think about how you thought, you're, not, you're, you're downplaying it. You're saying it was no big deal. But in the moment when it's right there and you're just literally a stream of consciousness on a paper, there's, there's the reality of what's going on in your head. So you do that as often as you need to throughout a week. Um, and then I want you to, I would, I would challenge you to start to sit down, uh, maybe see if you can find 10 minutes. Find 10 minutes of time once a week. And I would, pr- I would prefer this to be a time when they're feeling calm and collected, right? Like a time where you don't have any, anything immediately pressing, where you are generally feeling better, right? And I would challenge you to do what's going to seem very counterintuitive in that moment, which is open up your journal of thoughts for the week. So now you're sitting here calm and collected, feeling reasonably good. And I'm saying, go back into this journal of thoughts that you wrote down during the tough moments in your week mm-hmm. and read through them. Um, bring some conscious collective thought to what was going on in those tough moments. Again, you do this once, maybe kind of interesting, maybe it even brings you back and you're you're feeling anxiety again, but do this consistently and you start to see patterns in your thoughts. You start to see that the same situations and people and circumstances and so forth draw the same anxiety and emotions in you. It helps you get a better handle of where these sources are coming from. But then take it one step further than that and let's go through some of the questions that, that we talked about earlier, right? Like, I want you to pick one thought I want you to pick the hardest thought, pick the thought that maybe does bring you back to the moment. You go, man, that was a really tough moment in my week. Maybe it's giving you anxiety and and pain, just rereading it and then sort through through it with the questions to give yourself that perspective we talked about earlier. So is this thought true? Like, let's say the thought is I'm not good enough for whoever it is I'm talking to. Right? So is that true? Is that true? Can it be proven? Can it be scientifically proven? Right? Give yourself that reality check. Like, is this the whole truth? Is this all that is true? So challenge it with truth. Is this all that is true? Is this the whole truth? Who am I with that thought in my head? When that stream of consciousness is here, who am I? How do I treat myself, others? How do I do my work? Who am I? Who would I be and what else would I see about my life without it? If I could avoid that thought that's right there in black and white in front of me, who else would I have been in that moment? What else would I have seen about that moment? And going forward, what what else might I see? Give yourself the opposite too is another way to challenge it. Uh, If it's, I'm not good enough for these people, these people are not good enough for me, right? That sounds like a pompous thing to say under those circumstances. But again, it's not black and white, right or wrong. It's about perspective. We're not saying this is solving all the problems. We're saying, what other perspective can we give? So if if I'm maybe, you know, as an example, we talked about think better, live better. If I'm getting up on stage and feeling anxiety, like somehow I'm not good enough to give this talk that I'm about to give in this coaching session, I can say these people that are here are not good enough for me, right? They're, 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 they couldn't fill my shoes. And, and so again, it might sound pompous, but like, where can I find examples of truth in that in my life? Well, maybe it's the dad I am to my son, right? So it's like, I can, I can think about, okay, like, even though I don't feel good enough necessarily or, or confident enough to share this, there's a lot that I do that, that is incredibly great in my life. And I, and I, I, I'm not giving myself enough credit. Again, there's not right, right or wrongs. It's just perspective challenge yourself, give yourself an opposite. Is there at least some truth in the opposite thought here? And, and can I leverage that reality and that realization to make a, a, little, bit of st- a little bit of progress? Um, again, it, it's a tough process. And I think the consistency to Angel's point is important. You do this once, you might have a couple ahas, but if you sat down on a daily basis, whenever you caught yourself with one of those thoughts and you wrote it down, and you just brought awareness to it, that in itself is healthy. And then once a week for the next, let's say 60 days or so, you sit down and pick out the toughest moment from your week and you challenge it with this. 
And, and I wouldn't be surprised if on multiple weeks, it's the same kind of thought, because that's typically how we are as human beings. And you do the work, you, you, you invest that time and you say, is it true? Who am I with this thought? Who else would I be and what else would I see without it? What is the opposite? Can I find at least some glimmer of truth in the opposite? I will arm myself gradually with the perspective that will allow me to better handle those circumstances and those kind of thoughts going forward. Again, it's a process. It is about habits and rituals. It takes time, but it does help us um, over the period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I, I will just um, agree that um, I, I think I would love for people to know or to be reminded that all of us have to practice. We're all in practice. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking for quick fixes, like that kind of idea of trying to bypass, like it doesn't work. There is no bypassing. We actually have to go through whatever, you know, our, um, go through our lives and be present and do this hard work. And it does get easier with time. And um, I have experienced that in my own life. Um, that also is encouraging to myself, like that I can see evidence of, how when I practice these things, I grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And so then that encourages me to keep going, right? I get a taste of, of what that feels like. So thank you for that. Um, and so I do want to just end, you know, um, with the touching at least on this idea of spiritual bypassing or relentless positivity, which can be damaging and somehow um, help people see that it's, um, like, I think that I think as humans, like we polarize a lot. It's, we do tend to kind of go to extremes, but some of this is simply that um, Facebook or social media is, it's ne never full truth, right? Like a meme is just partial truth. There may be truth there, but it's not the fullness of truth. And so we can experience a lot of resistance and frustration. I know I can at times too, but, um, but we, I think it's helpful to kind of look at this as like, it isn't one or the other. So let's can we talk, help people understand the difference between desiring happiness seeking happiness even in hard times versus this idea of relentless positivity which makes sometimes can feel like shaming or judgment or not allowing for messiness right so the messiness of grief or anger or emotion um like they're not it's not about one or the other it's like we they we can, um, I'm, oh, I'm having a hard time finding this succinct yeah. question for you. Can co those feelings can coexist. Yeah, yeah they absolutely can. Um, yeah, I, we'll, I'll let you take it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's to sit here and say, like, we're always going to be happy and we're always going to be positive. I mean, that, that's impossible. And we're all a work in progress, right? Like nobody is above this work. You know, we're not above it. You still have seasons. You still have your thoughts get the best of you. Um, so reminding yourself to come from a place of love and kindness and caring, especially towards yourself. And how can you accept these feelings and work through them um, without resisting them from a place of love and comfort? Um, and, and that could look differently for, for people. It could be journaling. It could be speaking to a loved one, confiding in somebody with your thoughts and your emotions. But it, it, it is important to come from a place of love, especially for yourself. Yeah, I think love is messy. Love is imperfect, like you said, Krista, right? I mean, and that's what we have to remember. Looking, looking for everything to be always happy is looking for everything to always be perfect. And that's not reality. And so what we have to remind ourselves of, and again, we do have to remind ourselves of this, right? No one's above it, is that the expectation of perfection, the expectation of like enduring happiness, right? That there are no ebbs and flows in our life is, is that's a misnomer. I mean, that is, that is expecting the impossible um, without realizing it. And so ultimately what happens is if, if we are turning to this what I would call toxic positivity, i.e. not addressing the fact that life is messy and real and expecting it to just always be great or, or turning your back on somebody who's having problems just to focus on something more positive in your life, you are ultimately, a, you're a train wreck waiting to happen, right? Because that's, that's not living in reality. That's living in a fantasy. And eventually the, the, the bubble's going to pop and you're going to be faced with reality and you are not going to be prepared to deal with it. 
On the right. flip side I, of that. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, no, go, go ahead. Okay, well, I was thinking that's like a way of, that's another way of, um, it can be just sort of like pretending that all is well and refusal to look at what's hard is another way of suppressing and trying to bypass, isn't it? As opposed to this real true emotional agility that we want where we can flex and bend, you know, we're, you know, we can, we, we allow ourselves to feel joy and delight and possibility. And also we're human and there's this, you know, self-compassion and a part of that is common humanity, recognizing that we all, they struggle we all will taste fear. We all, you know, the goal isn't to pretend we're not human, but the goal is to somehow find an anchoring in, in the middle of this common humanity, right? Like, well, well it's, it's interesting because do you want the friend who is always going to tell you all the good things going in their, li- in their life, who has fresh baked cookies at their house, who their house is spotless, or do you want the friend who comes over in their gym clothes and tells you the realness, what's going on in their life, how hard it is to be a parent? And because that's the, that's the person I want to be friends with. I want to be friends with the person who's authentic and real and I can share stories with and truth and relate with and resonate with and then of course have the good moments too I just don't want it all to be negative but I want to feel that I'm not alone in this in this pain in in my thoughts and I want somebody who's going to listen and also relate to me and say hey you know what me too this is how I feel that's who I want to be friends with not the person that there's fresh baked cookies every time I go go over and their house is spotless and they're the best parent ever because I, I think those people are, we're not getting to meet the real them. We're able to connect with each other when we're vulnerable, when we are sharing our feelings and our experiences, because it reminds us that we're not alone, that we all feel pain and joy, and we can't feel the joy and be happy without the pain because we wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. No, I think, I think we've said it, like it, it has to coexist. Um, I think that's why, you know, again, we go back to, we'll call it this like self inquiry type journaling um, is doing hard things. It's looking at negative situations. Do the, do the gratitude journaling and the meditation and, and all of that stuff too, right? But balance yourself out. Do the things like look at those, those little wins and, and focus on them and, ha- and, 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 and be with them. But don't neglect the fact that you also have these negative feelings and that they're real. And some, and in many cases, they are tied to real events in your life. And, and, leverage like a process like that so those that self-inquiry journaling to realize that although a lot of that is real it's not always happening to you right it's like we we lose things in our lives but we don't lose them every single day it's our attachment to the loss that creates the con- consistent pain yeah. and and we we can get a better handle of dealing with it and coping with it if we address it if we bypass it it chips away at our subconscious whether we want it to or not But when we actually face it, it gives us the ability to cope in a more healthy way. And we leverage the negative with the positive, right? And it makes a world of difference. It takes time to practice that. I think what Mark just said is extremely important. We have to acknowledge the thoughts without attaching to them because we may, these feelings that we're having, we're... it's okay to have them. We're having these feelings every day, but it's as if the event is happening every day. And the event that is causing these feelings is not happening today. It's not happening tomorrow. It's, it's ha- it happened in the past, but your feelings are as if it's happening right now. So it's important to acknowledge these feelings without attaching to them. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's and it. I think of it like sometimes, you know, as it's really, it's the story I'm telling myself about it. So it's like, am I allowed to experience grief? Yep. I don't get to control all of that, but I can also observe the story that tells me you're never going to be happy again. You're not, you know, life is done or whatever it is, you know, like that, that's where I really try to like, I feel like that practice of acknowledging that mindfulness and that ability to pause, notice the thought so that then we can examine it is really important, right? So that I can see the attachment or the story that I'm telling myself, which is causing intense anguish. Um, And when I can just be here, I can see my way forward. I can see the next step. And I think realizing, the fact that you are realizing it is a story you're telling yourself or a thought that gives you the power to rewrite the story. 
So I think just in that statement itself, the fact that you can acknowledge that it's a thought, um, because so many of us attached to these events and this happened or someone treated me this way, but that's, a, it's, the event isn't what's making you sad. It's your thinking of the event. It's the story you're telling yourself around that activity, that event that happened that is causing you pain and suffering. So once you realize that it is a thought or a story that then gives you the power to rewrite it. You know, um, Mark said this quote, and it's always stuck with me. Nothing is good or bad as you're thinking and makes it so. Oh yeah. That's uh, a, that, I forget who said that, but yeah, that's a good quote. We, we use that all the time. I think that it's, again, it does not erase the real events. Right. And, and that that's like, there are real things that happen to us, but our attachment to those real things in relation to how it should have been right. Our expectation of how it should have been is what creates lasting pain, pain that we can't get over. And it is that it is, it is those circumstances when we realize that that event is not happening in our life every minute of every day, but we are feeling this way because of how we are attaching to it. I, easier to say than to actually work through, but we can get to a place where it provides freedom and growth for us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I really want to say, cause I, I acknowledge like, cause um, I have walked through trauma and there's a lot of people that I, in my community, probably yours too, that have PTSD there. They're, and it's like, so get help. Like, it's like, even as like, I think like, I'm always so cautious around this because my son struggled with mental illness. I know there's a lot of people like that can't, doesn't seem like they have a choice, just choose happiness, just choose, but, but choose to get help, choose to say, I'm not okay. Choose right. to say, I need the therapy or whatever. Um, to somebody to come alongside and help me begin to do this work, right? Like, I think that's so important too. We want to acknowledge that. I mean, that's such a good point too. You know, I brought that up earlier that we saw therapists when we needed therapists, right? I think therapy is good always. I mean, it's one of the reasons Angel and I attend seminars ourselves and, and, and have coaches and so forth. Like we're never above this. And sometimes there's a stigma about having a therapist or, or having a coach. I mean, like, and, and all of us need one. I mean, and, and I, I, in fact, if we all had one, we would be healthier because we'd be able to sort through some of this stuff that we bypass just naturally, right? Sometimes it's the busyness distracting us and pulling us away from dealing with it. And sometimes it's just our own inner willingness and saying, oh, like I should feel this way, right? Like I'm just going to stop feeling that way. And you, you can't just stop yourself from feeling that way. We, we, we naturally have feelings. So, I mean, that's something I love that, that point, Krista, is like, if you are feeling like you need help, don't feel bad about getting help. I mean, like there's plenty of sources of help out there for you. Um, and, and, and we need to be, uh, eliminate that stigma that therapy is like a, a weird thing or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Somebody's ringing my doorbell. Um, <laughs> so let's end. Um, would you just share a final thought, a bit of wisdom, word of encouragement, just something else you'd like people to know um, before we say goodbye? Or, you know, and that can include where you'd love them to come connect with you. Sure. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's remind yourself that everything first begins in your head. Everything that you believe and think first begins up here. And so what you think you see, and so you, we want to focus on what's going on up here. And so writing those thoughts down, um, good and bad, doing the gratitude journal, and then also doing the journal that challenges the mm -hmm. thoughts. And I think it's important because what you think up here is what you will see, because as we know, what we focus on grows. Um, so if you're thinking certain things, you're going to find them in the world. Um, so challenging your thoughts. Yeah, do that consistently too. I'll just back it up with that. Like if we can leverage some of the practices we've talked about today to be consistent with our, call it our own personal growth, we're going to see the progress that we want to see in our lives, the, the progress that we envision. It won't happen in a day. It may not happen in a week or two, but it will happen if we are consistent with it and take those little steps. Um, and so, yeah, Angel and I love to talk about this. I mean, we're on the yeah. journey with you. Um, we've said it already. You're not alone. I mean, we are all in this together. There's no question about that. 
Um, yeah, and, and, yeah, and as you can tell, we love talking about this. You know, this has been a great conversation. Um, and if your your followers would like to continue the conversation, they can find more on our blog on marketingangel.com. You know, we're also on Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook. Just search Marketing Angel, and we'll pop up. We also have a podcast titled Think Better, Live Better. Um, so there's tons of resources out there. We uh, respond to everyone, so definitely feel free to connect with us. We we'd love to see you there. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you guys so much for the conversation. Well, I'll end our um, interview and then just hang out hang out with me for one more second. Okay. You bet. okay.